Hi. In the previous screencast in this series, we've been exploring how four out of the five attributes of walking can help us understand the pattern of movements that constitute normal gait. The basic mechanisms are those of the inverted and simple pendulum, which allow remarkably efficient locomotion. Requirements for clearance in swing and to attain adequate step length require some modification to that simplest conceivable walking pattern, compass gait. In the last screencast, we saw that the inverted pendulum doesn't actually support body weight, and that even after some modification of the vertical component of the ground reaction, we still require a period of double support when the ground reaction forces under both limbs reinforce each other in order to support body weight throughout the gait cycle. We recognise that double support is not possible with the simple compass gait and needs a much more complex pattern of movements of the joint through double support. I commented that the exact nature of these movements is largely determined by the need for smooth transitions from the swing phase and into the stance phase. And this is going to be the subject of this screencast. There are two major transitions in the gait cycle. One between stance and swing at foot off, and the other between swing and stance at foot contact. Moving from stance into swing is relatively easy. Moving from swing to stance, however, is much more difficult. As I put it when delivering these lectures for the first time, it's a lot easier to fall off a log than onto one. In the old days, we used to talk about heel strike. Then it was recognised that many of our patients don't make contact with the heel. So we modified this to foot strike. What I'd like to convince you of today is the foot doesn't actually strike the ground at all and that a much better and more appropriate term is foot contact. It's interesting to note that David Winter first commented on this as long ago as 1992. I quote, the velocity of the heel immediately prior to foot contact is virtually zero vertically and low in the horizontal direction. Such findings raise the question as to why many researchers refer to this initial contact as heel strike. He also framed five primary tasks of walking, of which the third including controlling the foot trajectory to give a gentle heel or toe landing. Winter's view has faded a little in popularity over recent years, with some biomechanists actually emphasising the importance of collisions, as in this illustration from a recent review article in the Perry Gate issue of Physical Therapy. Just because the popularity of an opinion is waning, however, does not necessarily mean that it's untrue. And we'll stick with Winter's view that in normal walking, collisions are something we try and avoid. Let's first look at the evidence for this in the sagittal plane. In this animation, I've identified the point on the foot under which the ground reaction first appears, and then I've plotted its trajectory through swing. You can see that the foot comes into land smoothly and is travelling nearly horizontally just before it touches down. Jim Gage has likened this to the landing of an aeroplane. If we plot the horizontal velocity at this point, you'll see that its top speed is 4.4 metres per second in mid-swing. In other words, your foot in mid-swing is walking almost three times as fast as you are. But by foot contact, this has dropped to around 0.2 metres per second, or about 5% of its top speed. The data displayed here is from a rather cheap and cheerful estimation. Winter estimates a somewhat higher value, but I think he used a marker higher up on the heel, which may have led to an overestimation. So how can it be that just before foot contact, the pelvis is moving forwards at around about one and a half metres per second, and yet the foot is just about stationary already. Clearly there must be some movement in the joints in between. If we look at the normative gait data just before foot contact, we find that neither the pelvis nor the hip is moving appreciably. If there's no movement at the hip, then the knee must be moving forwards at approximately the same speed as the hip, and therefore the pelvis. But if you look closely at the graphs, you'll see that the knee starts flexing before initial contact. If you think about this, it will move the foot backwards relative to the knee. So if the knee is travelling forwards, the foot will be travelling forwards less quickly. Look at the graphs again, and you see that plantar flexion also starts in late swing. Just as with the knee, you can see that the effect of ankle plantar flexion is to move the heel back with respect to the ankle. This mechanism will further reduce the velocity of the part of the plantar surface of the heel that first makes contact with the ground. 
So, in summary, a gentle contact for heel is made by both knee flexion and ankle plantar flexion occurring before foot contact. You won't read this in many of the textbooks. Most of them describe knee flexion as occurring as a response to loading in early stance. It's often described as a shock absorbing mechanism, but we'll find an alternative explanation a little bit later in this lecture. The only author who I am aware of who has correctly described this is David Winter. This figure from one of his early papers depicts his calculation of just how much knee angular velocity is required to slow the heel down to stationary before foot contact. He does appear to have overlooked the contribution of the ankle plantar flexors, however. Now, this is only half the battle, because a smooth transition requires continuity through foot contact. Movements in first double support immediately after foot contact must therefore be a continuation of those in late swing immediately before it. These features are indeed seen in the gate graphs. So you can see how the requirement to reduce heel velocity before foot contact requires further modification of the gait pattern beyond what we've derived from earlier talks in this series. First of all, the knee must flex before initial contact, and this continues into early stance. The ankle must be plantar flexing also at initial contact, and this requires it to have been in a little dorsiflexion earlier in swing. Finally, the foot angle is modified as a consequence of changes in both the knee and ankle angles. Ensuring the foot contacts the ground gently is only part of the problem, however. We also want to keep the mass of the body moving forwards. We remember that the kinetic energy of the trunk is high at the end of one inverted pendulum arc, and we want to transfer this energy to the start of the next arc over the other limb to allow continued progression. If we simply allow the body to progress along one circular arc and transfer instantaneously to the other where they overlap, then we will require a high instantaneous force at the point of transfer. Even if we manage a smooth contact of the foot with the ground, there will still be a discontinuity in the centre of mass trajectory. Art Kyo has made this point well in a series of articles, although I disagree with him a little about the energy consequences of this. In walking, we modify the trajectory of the inverted pendulums through transition from swing to stance so that we smooth out this discontinuity and avoid the collision that would otherwise occur, as you can see here as we play the animation. To understand this, let's look at this picture of Vern as he enters late swing. I've also superimposed the trajectory of the hip joint centre, assumed to represent the forward movement of the trunk over this. At this point, the hip is still on the arc of the inverted pendulum and thus has a downwards component of velocity. By the time we get to foot contact, however, the centre of the mass velocity is nearly horizontal. It's still a little downward, but not very much. Most of the deceleration of the centre of mass in the vertical direction has thus been achieved in late swing before the foot makes contact with the floor. Note that this is quite different to the common misconception that the body is falling when it hits the floor and that vertical deceleration is achieved by the leading limb after foot contact. A lot of gait analysts need some convincing of this point, so let's look at two studies that have quantified vertical centre of mass position throughout the gait cycle. You can see that in both, the centre of mass is at its lowest, or very close to its lowest, at initial contact. Vertical deceleration has been achieved before initial contact by the action of the trailing limb. So how is the body decelerated? The trailing knee flexes a little to increase step length, as we saw in a previous video. In isolation, this would shorten the limb and allow the centre of mass to continue falling. But this is compensated for by the plantar flexors holding the ankle. The resulting heel rise effectively lengthens the limb and prevents and slows the fall of the centre of mass. As Verne enters double support, the centre of mass is thus travelling nearly horizontally, as we've shown. During double support, both feet are in contact with the ground. The trailing limb rotates about the toe, that is, Perry's third and fourth rockers and the leading limb rotates about the heel, Perry's first rock. Thus at the start of double support we can draw this triangle which links the centres of rotation in each foot and the hip joint centres. The two long sides of the triangles are thus the effective lengths of the trailing and leading limbs. 
If we move to opposite foot off, the end of first double support, then we can draw a similar triangle. Of course, in this case, the apex is considerably further forward, although the base has moved very little. If we superimpose these two triangles, we can see that the left-hand side of the triangle, which is the effective length of the trailing leg, has got longer, and the right-hand side, representing the effective length of the leading limb, has got shorter. This is the kinematic requirement to allow centre of mass to move quickly and horizontally through double support. The trailing limb gets longer by rapid plantar flexion, and to a lesser extent by controlling the amount of knee flexion that occurs. This leads to even more heel rise. The leading limb gets shorter by increasing knee flexion, and to a lesser extent by the centre of rotation transferring to the ankle, Perry's second rocker. Notice that in this explanation, stance phase knee flexion is a kinematic mechanism to allow the centre of mass to move horizontally forward through double support. It's got nothing to do with shock absorption. Generally speaking, we walk in such a way that we avoid impact shocks, rather than having a requirement to absorb them. So this allows us to tidy up the remaining unexplained features of the gait graphs. The length of the trailing limb is increased by rapid plantar flexion of the ankle. This in turn leads to heel rise. Finally, the knee flexes through first double support to allow the centre of mass to continue to move forwards and preserving the kinetic energy in the trunk. In summary, over the sequence of these video lectures, we've progressed from compass gait, the simplest conceivable pattern of bipedal walking, as typified by the red graphs on the left-hand side of this slide, to the full complexity of normal human walking, as depicted by the green graphs on the right. Throughout this, we've understood the reason for each of the incremental modifications, and can thus say, with some justification, that we fully understand the kinematic characteristics of normal walking in the sagittal plane. There are, of course, other planes, and our understanding of walking won't be complete without considering joint kinetics and muscle activations. But those will have to wait until I've done a bit more thinking.